I'm going to be continuing the series that we've been in for the last couple of weeks in Luke chapter 12. Um, It's a series um, that is just on eternal perspective in a temporary world. That's been our goal. So we've been going through Luke 12, piece by piece, verse by verse, and we've been pulling out different applications and truths to apply to our lives to help us see the world as it truly is and to have our eyes open to really what eternity means for our lives right now today. And that's going to be the continued theme of what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be in Luke chapter 12, verses 35 through 48. Um, That's where we're going to be studying. So you guys can start turning there in your Bibles if you have them. I just want to remind you as well that uh, if you have uh, the YouVersion Bible app on your phone, you can also use that. If you go open the app up and go to the events tab, you click on that. It's like the little three bars there. Click on Awaken Church. It'll be popped up there. And all of the points, all of the scripture we're studying, it's all going to be in that app, in that space. But they'll also be up on the screen as well if you just want to follow along there. Um, But to get our minds kind of set up to be prepared for what we're actually looking at today, I wanted to ask you guys a question. I think it'll help you relate to the text a little bit better. So let me see just a showing of hands. If you have family or friends who live out of town or maybe in another state. Yeah, a huge amount of us. That's what I thought. Um, I'm no different. My family and my wife's family, um, they're out of town. They, nobody really that is in our immediate family lives in Tennessee. Um, and we have a lot of friends back from where we originally moved from when we came here. So because of that, we have a lot of visitors to our house who come visit us. And it's really interesting, and I think you guys will relate to this, because if you have visitors, friends, or family coming from out of town to visit you, usually there's a lot of preparation involved in getting the house ready for them to show up. Um, I know for us at our house, there's a lot of work to be done um, when someone is coming. Uh, We have to get a bedroom ready for them, make sure they got a place to sleep. We got to clean up the entire downstairs of our house, the kitchen area, the living room, put things away, make sure it's set up and ready. I know Breezy likes to usually make snacks and little treats that can be out for them when they walk in. So if they're hungry, they can grab a snack. We like to play games with people. So when we uh, know friends or family are going to be in town, we usually go select some different board games and fun stuff to do and set them out on the table so they're ready to go right when, they're, right when they get there. And then usually I find myself, after we've gotten everything kind of prepared and set up, I'll usually just be sitting there on the couch just in this like excited anticipation for my family members or my friends I haven't seen in a long time to get there. And I'm just like on the couch constantly checking my watch like, man, when are they going to get here? And I'm texting them, hey, are you getting closer? Where where are you at? And what I think is important to realize about that is that the reason why we do all of that work and we're so excited is because that's how we're showing love to these people. That's how we're showing that we care, that that they're coming, that, that they matter. Because if they were to show up and your house was a mess and you had no place for them to sleep, and there was nothing for them to eat, and you were sleeping on the couch when they knock on the door, and you're not able to go get it, that does not communicate that you really care, or that you're excited about them, or that you love them. And it's that mentality that Jesus is actually going to be speaking from, in a sense, as we dive into these verses. Um, As we get into this, it's very similar. He's driving home some similar points. But he's going to be speaking of himself as the one that we're waiting for. He's going to be speaking of himself as the one who has been gone and who is going to be showing up soon. And this is really important for us because, again, this is something that's talking about our future. This is what Jesus is going to be getting at. Jesus is one day going to return, and we need to be ready. That's everything that he's driving at. So in a very serious way, ultimately, what we're going to be seeing out of this text today in Luke 12 is that Jesus wants us to be ready and stay ready. Be ready for him to come and stay ready for him to get here. So that's going to be the title of our message today. Be ready and stay ready. And that's going to set us up with the right frame of mind as we get into these verses. So to start off, if you would just read with me Luke 12, uh, verses 35 and 36. It says, Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. 
and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. So this is the first little section that I want us to unpack, because there's a lot being said here, and I want to bring our first point out from this. So point number one is our future needs to affect our present. Our future needs to affect our present. So this is going to be made a lot more clear sense of as we start to break this down. So Jesus right here, he's alluding to the proper role that we have in awaiting his return. And he says several things that might be missed on us because of our culture and our time that were not missed to the people that he was originally speaking this to. He's using some words that for them were very clear, but to us are not. So let me explain this. Jesus says to be dressed for action and to keep our lamps burning. There was a lot implied in that. So that first phrase, to be dressed for action, what that means is to have your loins girded. So that's kind of a weird term. We don't use the term loins very much. Um, But the idea of having your loins girded was that they wore robes back in, in this time period. Everybody had an outer cloak that they would wear as they walked around and did things. And to have your loins girded, what that meant is that you take your long robe that was all the way to the ground, and you'd pick it up and kind of ravel it into a, a small ball, and then you tuck it into your belt. And the point of doing that is you're way more free to move. And this is a picture of active work. That's the idea. Somebody who had, who had girded their loins is going to be engaged and aware of what's going on around them. They're able to act. That's the idea. So Jesus is trying to convey that mentality when he says that. Be dressed for action. And then in the second part, when he says that you need to keep the lamps burning, that was a process. They didn't have lights like we have now, where you can just flick a light on and the light stays on, and when you want it to go out, you shut it off. They had lamps, and they were usually small, and they ran off oil. So to keep a lamp burning was like a very ongoing, continuous, intentional process. You'd have to have oil set aside, a whole stockpile of it ready and available for you, And you'd have to be keeping a close eye because as it's burning, it's going to get down. And if the fire goes out, it was really hard to start fire usually. It was not an easy thing to do. So they didn't want it to go out. So you had to keep a close eye on where's the fire at, how far is the oil down, and be ready at any moment. All right, time to fill this up, fill it. And then the wicks that they had, they would burn down and kind of just disappear. So you'd have to trim it regularly so that it would stay strong and, and keep burning. So when Jesus is using this language of be dressed for action and keep your lamps burning, he's really trying to convey the idea of people being uh, engaged and aware, ready to act on the work that's going on around them, and people who are continuously doing this, and they're very intentional about what they're doing. That's what he's trying to convey. And he's saying that they need to do this because this is stressing a manner of active waiting, That's what we want to take from this. It's a manner of active waiting in anticipation of him showing up. That's what he's conveying. These people, hey, you guys need to be dressed for action and keep the candles burning while you wait for the master to come back from the wedding feast. And that's the next important piece that I want us to unpack. These people are to be working while they're waiting for the master. That word master means Lord. He's talking about himself for the master to return from the wedding feast. So there's some things being implied here as well. So to make sense of it, what you need to know is that weddings did not work the same way that weddings work today. In our culture, a wedding happens, we set a date, we send out invitations, people show up, there's a ceremony, usually a reception, it all happens in an afternoon or an evening. Everyone's, whoa, it's awesome, they're married, and then we all go home, and the couple goes out on their honeymoon. That's not how they did it. The way that it worked for them was this was a seven days long event. Um, When a wedding feast was happening, there would be invitations set out to the people who lived far away, but this was also a community thing. So everybody who lived in a town, most people were invited to celebrate alongside the bride and groom. And what they do is on day one, 
the groom would go get the bride, and all this whole procession of people would go be there with them, and they would walk with the bride, and they would be singing, and they would be lifting up the groom, and they're excited, and they get to this location, and they have this big feast, and it's super joyful, and they're playing and having fun, and then that night would be the first night that the bride and groom would officially be together. They'd go home together, and everybody would stay in this town, and the following morning, it would be, it's official, they are completely married, and six more days of feasting, singing, and celebrating would ensue. Now, over that course of that six days, it wasn't expected that everybody had to stay for the entirety of it. People could leave day three. People could leave day seven if they wanted. It, didn't, it didn't, wasn't a specific thing. It was just that these feasts went for a really long time. So the implication of a master being away for, at the wedding feast, it's implied that it's far off. So it's a journey to get there. But then it's implied that, well, it's hard to know exactly when the master is going to come back because he might come back day three, but he's got to travel, or he might wait till day seven and then he's still got to travel. The servants don't know. So the idea of it is there's a lot of mystery involved in the waiting on the master's return. With that in mind, Jesus wants us to understand this is what it's like for us in waiting for him. We are to be working ready, engaged, active in the things with our loins girded. We're actively doing stuff. We're continuously, intentionally serving, and we're waiting for him so that when he knocks at the door, we're there. We've been anticipating it. We're excited for his return. Now, in the parable, the work is specific. It's like housework and stuff like that, but this has implication for us that's maybe a little less specific, but it's really important. Because the work that Jesus wants us to be engaged with looks like a couple things. It's very simply put, the work that he wants us to be occupied with while he's away is loving God and loving people. Super simply put. Now that boils down to several things, and I'll make it a little bit more clear, but those are the two things you want to have in mind. As you're waiting Jesus' return, you need to be loving God and loving people. So what does that look like? Well, loving God looks like pursuing spiritual maturity. A, a faithful servant who's doing what they are supposed to be doing, the, the right work that they're asked, is going to be digging into God's word because they want to understand the commands of the master, the commands of Jesus. They want to grow. They want to be shaped. They want to be molded. They want truth to be revealed, not only for how they live, but they want their eyes to see the world the way their master sees the world. That's what we want. That's spiritual maturity. That's what we want. That's what it looks like to be loving God. And then secondly, and this is huge, super important, is it means turning from sin. Turning from sin is what it means to be walking in holiness. It, turning from sin is a simple way to say that you are being sanctified over time. It's the idea of you are giving up the way you used to be. Now, that is a marker of a follower of Jesus' life from the beginning, but over time, it should be continuing, where we are not living the same way that we used to. That's what it looks like to do the work of loving God while he's away. But then the other part of it is loving people, and what that looks like is a couple things, but one of them is generosity. And this goes for people who are fellow believers and disciples in Christ who are walking alongside us as well as people who are not following Jesus. We should be generous with our time, our money, and the resources that we have, both for the people in the church as we see needs coming up, where we go out of our way to, to help them or to meet those needs or to give generously to take care of others, or when we see people who don't know Jesus Yet we're going to express the love of Jesus in in these various ways of meeting those needs and showing them that we do care through that generosity, being available to help them. But then that's where the next piece comes in when it comes to loving people is this generosity is great, but there's another step that's actually more important, and it's sharing the gospel. Every single one of us is called to love people by sharing the gospel with those who don't know Jesus by expressing the truth of God's word, both through our actions and through the actual word of God being shared to them. 
We need to share the truth of the gospel, what it means to follow Jesus, to be saved, to turn from sin and be given new life. That's what it looks like to love people. Both of those things are super important. When we're talking about being dressed for action and keeping the lamps burning, that's what we're talking about, loving God and loving people. That's what we're doing. And we're doing this because we want and need to be occupied while we wait. We need to be occupied while we wait because when the master returns, that's where blessing is found. That's what we're going to see in these next two verses, verses 38, or 37 and 38, if you want to read these. It says, if he comes, oh no, sorry, I read a little too far. Blessed are those servants who the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. Jesus says a couple things here. He says that these servants who he knocks at the door and they're ready when he shows up and they open the door to him, they're going to be blessed. And the word blessed means happy or fortunate. That's the word that he's using. And the reason why they're blessed is because he says that the master will seat these servants at the table, let them recline at the table, and then the master is going to serve them and care for them. Now, what you need to understand about this is this is an unbelievable, radical picture of kindness and care and love. Like, crazy. This is not normal at all. And actually, if you are an ancient hearer of what Jesus is saying, this like breaks all the normal conventions of society so much that people would have been like possibly angry at Jesus for even mentioning this. But Jesus is doing it with intentionality. He's trying to show that this is an eternal picture of what happens when he returns to faithful servants, that they are given a seat at the table, that they are blessed, they're given rest, they're supplied, and the master loves them well. That's who Jesus is. Now, what's important about that is these servants didn't earn that, and that's really important to know. The servants were just doing their job, They did what they were supposed to do, but that's what a servant's role is. They didn't earn anything special, and this is extremely special care and love. And it's completely out of the grace of the master. It's not because they earned it, because they did what was required to be paid this reward. That's not what it was. They did what they were asked, and the master is kind and gracious to them in in doing this. That's an important note for this because that's the way it is in our lives. When we do the work of Jesus and he returns, you did not earn your salvation. He doesn't owe you anything. It's out of his grace that he's offering this eternity and this rest to you. Simply, the work that we're doing is just a desire, like we talked about, the reason why we set our houses up for when our family and friends come. It's a way to show Jesus that we love him and we're waiting for him and we want to honor him. And by doing that, that is an expression of faith in him. And when Jesus returns, this is an assurance that he notices it and he cares and he loves. So it's important to know that this is a incredible, generous, gracious thing, but not everyone's going to receive it. Not everybody is going to get this gracious gift. That's what he's going to talk about in verses 39 and 40. Let's read these ones together. He says, But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Okay, Jesus changes things up a little bit here. Up to this point, as he talked about the master and the servant, he was the master. In all the references, he's the master being waited on and we're the servant. But now in this little piece, he switches gears. Now the master is talking about us. We are the master of the house. And he is being represented as the thief. And I want to make this clear exactly why, what, what he means by this. 
Now, what he's saying is that this master who's representative of us, representative of us, unlike earlier where these people were prepared and ready, this person is not ready. And the specific thing that he's not ready for is for the coming of this thief, for this thief to arrive. He's unprepared, doesn't see it coming, is not anticipating it at all. And the master winds up leaving his house because he's not anticipating the thief. And we don't know, Jesus doesn't give the exact reasons other than he didn't expect the thief to come. But there, we don't know the exact reasoning behind why he left fully, but you could imply and think a couple of reasons why he might have, uh, I mean, I have to speak real loud. <laughs> um, there's a, a couple of reasons uh, why he might have left. And some of those reasons might be because he was busy with his own plans. This master might have left the house, not prepared for the thief to show up because he was pursuing his own desires. Maybe he had goals in mind for his future that he's trying to achieve, so he leaves the house, not expecting the thief to come. Now, that's a real problem because the thief is going to show up. And the picture of this thief who arrives, man, that's so distracting. (laughs) But we can't wait. We got to keep pushing forward. The picture of the thief arriving is a picture of significant loss. If the thief shows up, whoever owns that house that the master has left, that person is losing a lot of stuff, valuable things. It's not a good situation for them. Actually, here's what we're going to do. Lord, would you please let that rain slow down quickly because that would be very helpful for all of us. But Lord, let it be known that if not, Lord, help us to understand your word and hear it well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So, Jesus says, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at a time that you do not expect. Thank you, Lord. When Jesus returns, it's not going to be in a moment that everybody's just ready for. It's not going to be super clear when he's going to show up and and get back. But Jesus's point is that he is coming back, and the people who are not prepared will suffer immense loss. So you need to be ready. You need to be prepared for when he shows up. That's what he's trying to get across there. Now for us, like we talked about earlier, the clear picture is that we avoid this loss by being ready for Jesus' arrival, by being prepared, by being dressed for action, by keeping the lamps burning like we talked about. That's what Jesus is looking for. But I want to let you guys know that being ready for his arrival, for him to show up, that, that does not just mean being aware generally of Jesus. It doesn't mean that you just have a mental acceptance that Jesus is out there, that he's real, that he's someday coming back. That's not what he means by being ready. That's an element of it, but that's not it. It means action, just like what we talked about earlier. It means working, actively doing something, truly serving God. This is why our future, knowing what our future is, needs to affect our present. What you are doing right now needs to be affected by the knowledge that one day Jesus is coming back and you need to be ready. Now, Jesus expects us in living in a life of action, he expects us to give him our entire lives. And the reason why I think that's important to notice is because this is not something, oftentimes when we think of giving Jesus our life, we think of it as just a prayer. We prayed this prayer. Jesus is not asking you for a one-time frivolous prayer. And I don't mean to that to be harsh. I mean that out of love. I mean that to express the truth of what this is. And I choose that word frivolous very intentionally. That means not having any serious purpose or value. When we pray a prayer asking God to save us, but there is no serious purpose behind that prayer, there's no value really follow through on it, that prayer is not meaning much. That prayer can mean something. It can be valuable. 
It can have purpose, but that purpose comes in actually act, living actively in obedience after you've prayed. And that's what Jesus wants. And Jesus makes that super clear to us in Luke 9, verses 23 and 24, that he's looking for people who are giving their whole life. Let me read these verses to you. It says, And Jesus said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake would save it. That's what Jesus is looking for. That's what Jesus wants from his followers, a life devoted to him. Not a frivolous prayer, a life of action. That's what he's asking of us. It's exactly this obedient servitude that Jesus is going to be speaking about in verses 41 through 44. So let's go read that together. He says, or it says, Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all of his possessions. This is where our second point is going to come from, is our last point for today. And it's God expects us to honor him with what he has given us. God expects us to honor him with what he has given us. Now Jesus asks, a rhetorical question when Peter asks this of Jesus. G- Peter is like, Jesus, are you, when you're saying all this, is this for just us as the apostles or is this for everybody? And Jesus doesn't give him a super specific answer, but we can read into what it is that Jesus means by what he ultimately says. He gives this rhetorical question of, who is the faithful and wise manager? And by saying that, it's rhetorical in that he's asking you, are you the faithful and wise manager? Who is that person? You may be or you may not be, but he he goes on to make his point. Now, the important thing about when he says this, who is the faithful and wise manager, is a manager or a steward was a very important role. It's not a small thing. So a manager or steward's job was to oversee all of the master's resources and, and things. So when Jesus is saying this, who is the wise and faithful manager or steward, he's conveying the idea of who is the person who is taking care of the things I gave them well. And in this case, it would be a household. That's what a steward would oversee. That would include other servants. So the household manager or steward was responsible for, like what we read, giving the food out to the rest of the servants. He was responsible for making sure they were fed on time, that they were healthy, that they were doing what they were supposed to do. And he was responsible for investing the master's resources so that it would gain and it would, it would grow. And then even beyond that, he's responsible for, if there's problems going on, maintaining the master's resources so that it's not wasted. So Jesus is trying to get at this idea of, I've given you something who is the person who is wise and faithful with what I've given? Who is honoring me with what I gave you? Because you need to be doing that. That's what he's, he's trying to lay out. Now, this application, as I said before, does really range to all people. But I want to note before we move forward, it also has very clear and kind of extra implication to those who are leaders in the church. So I want to point that out because if you are a leader in in really any way in the church, you really need to be paying attention to this a little extra. But this does go for everybody. So what Jesus says is those who are found having been faithful, good stewards or good servants, that they're going to be set over all of his possessions. That's the idea of promotion. When he returns, he's going to promote them to oversee everything. Now, It's just, the reason he's doing this is, again, has eternal perspective in mind. What he's saying this for is because he wants them to see that this is a picture of being found trustworthy upon the return and then being blessed excessively by the master. That's what we're hoping for in Jesus and Jesus when he returns, 
that we would be blessed. So Jesus is confirming that as we read through this. Now, I think an important question for us to ask is, what has God given us personally to honor Him with? What is the things God gave you to honor Him with? Now, I'm going to map out a few things because I think we go to a couple smaller things, but really this is a very broad, large thing. When God has asked us to be good stewards, it covers a lot. So here's a couple of things. Maybe He's given you understanding of the Bible. That's something you have to steward. And what I mean by that is you have a responsibility now to build up and encourage and share that truth that you know from the Word and not just sit there quietly and hoard it all to yourself and judge others because they don't understand things. He gave you that for a purpose, to build others up. That's something you have to steward. Another thing might be physical wealth or finances. Maybe He's given you a a lot, opportunities to earn a lot. That is something he's asking you to steward and be generous with. Maybe God's given you a family. This is one that we skip over all the time. If you have a family, if you have children, you have a responsibility to lead your family in a way that represents Christ and mirrors Christ. You have a responsibility to pour into your family, to share truth of the word, to model right relationship with God for your family. And if you are not doing that, if you're living and putting other things as priority, then you are not stewarding that well. A family might be the thing that he's given you, or he might have given you the opportunity to share with others. There's some people who no longer have, either because of old age or injury or circumstances in life, where they can't really go out. They're isolated. They don't have the opportunity to speak to others. But God's given many of us the opportunity to share truth with coworkers, with friends and family, and we're around them constantly. And by not doing that, by just being quiet and avoiding these conversations and saying, oh, somebody else will do it, they'll ask me. By doing that, we are not stewarding something that God gave us well. Those are a couple areas that apply to everybody. And, and, and these things may be... More, People may have more things than just one of these. It's not just that one applies. You might have all of them. If you're somebody who's a leader in the church, it might look like leading a ministry, a specific area of going out and and pursuing loving Jesus and, and caring for people. That might be a thing that God gave you to steward and care about. It might be training up followers of Jesus. That means something. You actually have to do that. Not just think about it and and talk about it, but actually go do it. And then lastly, it might be teaching people right doctrine, bringing truth where there's things that are warped and twisted, sharing that truth. If you're a leader in the church, these are responsibilities that we have in various ways. So we need to be aware of that as we're pursuing Jesus. Because like we talked about earlier, not everyone is going to be doing this. Not everybody is ready. Not everybody is good stewards. Not everybody is a good manager. And that's what he's gonna, Jesus is going to get at in verses 45 and 46, if you would read this with me. It says, But if that servant says to himself, My master is delayed in coming, and he begins to beat the male and female servants and eat and drink and get drunk, The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect, and at an hour that he does not know. And the master will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. Now, if that didn't sound good to you, it's because it's not. It's not good. You don't want to be that person. You don't want to be the unfaithful steward. I want you guys to notice all the different ways this unfaithful manager is described when you get to the root of it. One, he's described as feeling no weight in the waiting for the master. He's supposed to be anticipating the master's return, but he says, "Eh, my master's delayed. What's the big deal? I'm going to do kind of what I want to do. There's not any weight or, or deep conviction of, I need to be doing what I'm doing while the master's gone. There's no weight to that, and that's a warning. Another thing that this unfaithful manager shows us is that 
he uh, mistreats the master's people. The master's servants, he treats them poorly. It says that he beats the male and female slaves. He's treating them awfully, and that was not a good thing. You didn't want to do that. But this master has no care for how he speaks to and treats and, and you know, engages with these other servants. He's also a servant, but he treats them as lesser. Another thing is he takes advantage of the master's servants. So that's part of what is being said there in the, when it says that he eat, ate and drank the master's stuff. The idea is that the servants were producing this stuff. It's the servants who are doing the work that's producing the, the growth. So he sees it and is like, eh, this is all for me. I'm going to do this with what I, what I want, what benefits me, with what makes me comfortable, what makes me happy, what elevates me. I don't care about them. I'm going to use them to pursue my purposes. So he's ad- gaining advantage off of the backs of these servants. That's another marker. And then the last marker that I saw there is that he wastes the master's resources on himself. When it says that he ate and drank and then got drunk, the idea is it's completely wasteful. It's useless what he's doing. Now, those four markers, I think, are important to notice. But what I want us to see out of that is that this servant who doesn't care about the master's coming, he receives a really harsh punishment. He says that he's cut up bad, and he's put out with the unfaithful. That idea of being put out with the unfaithful is that this person did not honor the master, and their actions showed that they had no allegiance to the master, and therefore they are cast out with those who don't believe. And that's the picture that we're supposed to be getting, is that those who claim to be part of the master's house, yet live a life not in anticipation, taking advantage of and not honoring the Lord in any way, those people are proving that they have no desire for the Lord to return. They don't care. They are not faithful servants. And the penalty for them will be the same as those who are not servants at all, the unfaithful. They're going to be cast out. And that is a harsh warning. This servant dishonored the master greatly in his behavior when he could have chosen to honor and love the master with his behavior. And that's the warning for us. This picture of his punishment is that there's great weight to it. It's not a small thing. God takes very seriously the things that he's given us to manage, and he expects us to manage those things well. God wants our obedience, but he wants it to be given willingly. That's part of the point here too, is that he's not forcing them to do it. He wants them to do it because they they want to do it. And this is why Jesus closes out this section in the way that he's going to. Let's read these last few verses, verses 47 and 48. It says, And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. Summing up all of this very quickly and easily is that the point here is that we are to be responsible to what has been given and what has been asked. Pretty simple point. That's what God is asking of us. And I think so often when we think about being responsible to what God has asked us, we think of it in a very kind of only half the picture way. So what I mean by that is we think of, oh, I need to follow Jesus. I need to not do things that God said is bad. So I'm not going to do those things. And what happens over time is we try to turn from our sin. We do do that. And then we get to a point where our life looks radically different than it once looked. But what we're not realizing and what Jesus is really trying to drive home in this last little piece about doing what the master said and the penalty or the punishment for not doing that is that just in in the same way that doing the things that God said that you shouldn't do is bad, also failing to do the stuff that God said you should do is bad. So let me explain that a little more simply because I know that's a lot of words and a little confusing. 
It's the difference between sins of commission, something you do, and sins of omission, something you did not do. And Jesus, what he's teaching here is if you are preparing and being ready for his eventual return, it looks like both things, not doing the things that you shouldn't and doing the things that you should. And he's looking for both from his servants. This entire passage today is warning, is warning us of something, but it's also encouraging us to something. We have a future place at the table with Jesus. That's beautiful. We have this incredible blessing found in Jesus. That's beautiful. But we also need to know that that requires something of us now in this present moment. That being said, our future needs to affect our present. And God expects us to honor him with what he has given us. That's what this entire text is really getting at. So with the entirety of all of this in our mind and with really thinking ahead to eternity and what that means for our lives, we need to know that we need to be ready and we need to stay ready for Jesus' coming. And that has implications now. 